do this. Okay, so uh, this is a, a kind of a lecture of, uh, summarizing the course, and I went over the uh, the course topics. And um, if you have any questions related to the course or related to the oral exam, then uh, ask me either in uh, Mentimeter or in Zoom chat. Um, we can handle both. So uh, a little bit about the exam. So the exam is primarily about your um, um, yes so some older videos are uploaded uh you should you are kind of expected to watch them so most of the questions in the exam are not memory questions so we will not ask you oh yeah what was on that video uh but they are mostly conceptual questions such that if you watch the videos you will kind of be able to make connections right so you should watch the videos which are posted on the course uh, wiki but we uh, recorded them like last year or earlier so they are still relevant yeah just so that the example introduction video you hadn't uploaded a 2021 one so the introduction video from last year is actually an exception uh that one is not relevant uh we changed the the format of the course somewhat such that you don't need to watch that one okay so the introduction um, video from last year is the exception to the rule, <laughs> okay? Uh, and I don't remember why did I put the new one, I will check. If we have recorded it, then I will post it. Maybe I didn't record the, the introduction lecture. I will, I will double check that. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, what else did I wanted to say? Oh yeah, so the uh, oral exam is on Tuesday. So there is not a lot of time uh, left, I think. Is it on Tuesday? I think it is, right? Yes, it should be. Yeah, it should be that nothing changed. I double check um, what the, let me just double check what is the exam office saying. In our course case, so I go, for the oral exams are normally not managed by the uh, examination office, uh, but in case they do manage that, then I need to know. IMT 4.3, it's been a long day. All right, so yeah, that's, that's fine, but I didn't want that actually. I want the video for IMT for 306. I want this one. There is nothing on Studio Web, but the. Um, there is nothing here neither. Yeah, that's perfect. Wiki sets exam schedule for the 11th, which is Tuesday. Yeah, why they say scriftling? It's Muntling. Yeah. I think we are, we should be fine. I will clarify that. So anyway, uh, we have an oral exam on Tuesday. Uh, double check the, uh, the schedule. If you haven't put yourself in, uh, then put yourself in. Um, yeah, you guys are not morning risers, right? <laughs> That's okay. All right, so we will go according to the schedule and um, uh, the exam is worth 60%. So that means the project is mostly actually uh, like a major part of the of the exam. So you will be asked about the project and you will be spending like the first half of the oral exam discussing the project. Uh, and then the second half is dedicated to some topics from the uh, from the course. Uh, normally what we do is we have kind of a sheets of paper with some of the topics and you, if it's an oral exam, you physically av available and then you uh, randomly pick one and then you talk about it and then you randomly pick another one and another one. So we usually have like three and then you sort of pick something at random and, and you talk about it such that we don't ask you about everything that was in the course. We kind of ask you three random things. Um, Given that the exam is going to be happening in Zoom, 
um, for most of you, um, we will see how we're gonna do this paper thing with the randomization of the choices, but uh, be expecting uh, that we might ask you some things what we are gonna talk today in the in the summary. Okay. Um, will there be a feedback on the paper before the exam date? Uh, not likely. So we will probably give you feedback on the exam date. Uh, because we will have it all uh, marked and read and prepared, but uh, I cannot give you feedback before that, unfortunately, due to the really tight uh, time um, between um, sorry, the time between the between now and the exam next week. So we, we're gonna spend the weekend and then have a session with uh, Susiang and Abile on Monday. Uh, and then I will not have enough time to write it up all to you. We will give you feedback on the day. Um, I don't think it matters. I mean, you're gonna report what you've done for the report and for the project. And also the questions related to the course uh, a sort of, uh, you know, um, work agnostic such that the feedback on the work uh, is kind of a combination of your discussion in the exam and the report, right? Um, was the presentation included in the grade? Uh, yes, the presentation is part of the, of, of the portfolio. So um, we... Um, we have kind of like the uh, portfolio for the, yeah, it's a little bit messed up. Like it should be just one grade. Uh, I, I don't think I have to double check with the exam office if they have updated because uh, on the website, it says that you have a split between the oral exam and the portfolio and the project. Uh, but we did the change last year such that it's just one grade uh, and the, presentation, the project, the report, and the oral exam, they basically contribute to the portfolio, such that you basically get a final grade based on everything, uh, such that we don't submit to the exam office uh, multiple grades. But uh, yeah, there, there was some sort of mishap between the, the prepared documentation that we've done and the exam office perception of it. And that's what I what you've seen like when I, I browsed that it still says written exam. We didn't have written exams for like, uh, yeah, for the last like four years. So uh, there is some sort of inconsistency somewhere. Uh, so I do hope you will basically get a, like a single evaluation, which is the portfolio for everything. Um, yes, so uh, Su Xiang and Abile will be on the exam. Yes, uh, a presentation is included. Uh, feedback is going to come later. Um, yeah, exactly. So that's what I'm saying. Like it says that you need to pass uh, the paper, but that has been changed uh, to be that you do need to have a project, but that is just an obligatory task without a grade. And I've already submitted that. So you all who are taking the oral exam are already past that burden of uh, being uh, involved in the project. So there is no uh, need for anything extra. I've already submitted it to the examination office. All right, any other questions? So keep the questions coming um, and we kind of move on with the summary. So one of the first topics that we had was uh, critical thinking, right? Um, and then uh, the question is what you can, you know, associate it with uh, what, um, what comes to mind, what words come to mind or terms if you think about uh, critical thinking. Do you guys have the ability to answer to this question? 
or did I mess up the Mentimeter? All right, so type stuff. Kind of reminds me a little bit of my Norwegian course. I like I have to uh, associate the Norwegian words to some things. Yeah, okay. A bit more specific. Analyzing stuff, yes. Bias, that's a good one. Logical connections, yes. I was hoping someone will say logic, right? Uh, that is super important. Uh, what else? What were the terms that we spent some time discussing in the, in the lecture? So analyzing stuff, that's fine, but that's someone who, let's say, um, in primary school can say about, yeah, we need to, you know, analyze stuff. Um, okay, synthesizing, that's better. What can you do with logical connections? Logical connections between what? Evaluation, that's a good one, yeah. Statements and arguments and claims, yes, exactly, right. So you start uh, Googling stuff, I guess, and you're kind of getting there. So uh, that's that's what you need to, ref re uh, you know, uh, refresh, right? Um, so you need to be able to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit more on what critical thinking is and how it influences your work. What you need to kind of uh, structure, like how do you need to structure your arguments and your claims uh, and what is the difference between an opinion and the uh, inference and things like this, right? So that, that is a little bit more, uh, more involved. Um, fallacies, yeah, that's good. So that's the next question. The next question is about logical fallacies. So uh, without Googling, what logical fallacies do you know or do you remember from the course? Yeah, there, there is um, uh, in the exam, unfortunately, it's like an oral exam, so there is no Googling. <laughs> uh, so try to uh, re recall what logical fallacies do you know or what have we discussed in the, in the lecture? A gambler fallacy, yeah. So if, if that is a question in the exam, you will need to elaborate. So you will need to explain what the, the fallacy is. Strowman, yeah, that's a good one. What else do you remember? <laughs> yeah. Appeal to feeling. Yeah. Appeal to emotions. Ad hominem, um, yeah, not true Scotsman, very nice, yes. Appeal to what? Appeal to authority, you can include, right? So you're getting the you you're getting the idea, right? So it is useful to recall some of those uh, logical fallacies and uh, understand why they are fallacies. Um, uh, whether vaccines work or not, yeah, that is um, difficult to say without the data, okay? So um, governments make an argument that, that say uh, the benefits of the of the vaccination outweighed the risks and the costs, right? And they make that claim, right? That, that make that claim, but it, it's just a claim with no supporting evidence. You do need to have data to, to support that particular claim. Um, so, and 
if you just say, well, the benefits outweigh the costs, then uh, you, ha you ha kind of need to base it on something. Um, so what is the cost? What are the benefits? And do they kind of balance or you kind of win, right? Uh, without the data, you can't really logically make a, an argument. Um, yeah, Ben? I guess the using uh, expert opinion and all of that, even though it's a fallacy, I was like, yeah, I'll take the vaccine because the doctor tells me, I guess. Yeah, so that's they kind have of the, the expertise. By authority, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's a fallacy, but you kind of need to be critical about what fallacies and when it fits and when it doesn't fit. Sometimes it fits, I guess. Yeah. So I, I read like a, a bit of a controversial um, paper, uh, which was suggesting, which did some data analysis. And the paper was suggesting that in uh, most European countries, uh, the problems due to vaccination were actually higher than the problems due to COVID itself before the vaccination started, right? Uh, and the, the data was basically saying that, like the data from before the vaccination started on COVID was much uh, smaller in terms of impact to the data of uh, impact of the vaccination having on the population, right? The problem with this is what? Uh, what what's the problem comparing those two uh, data samples? Sample size? Sample size, what else? Biased sampling potential? Yeah, it, it is kind of like the, the period before the vaccination could have been really different in COVID than the period with the vaccination, right? So that actually before the, the current wave, like the, the third wave, uh, the previous period uh, was actually quite uh, mild compared to this current period, right? Um, so the taking the data for here for the vaccine and from here for the COVID is kind of a comparing apples and oranges a little bit. It's, it's a little bit inconsistent, right? Uh, you would need to compare the same period, uh, basically. And that is hard. So yeah, anyway, um, let's move on. We have lots of slides. So uh, <laughs> uh, cloud computing. So what terms come to mind if you need to talk about cloud computing? That's true. It's mostly Linux. What else relates to cloud? Good. Yeah. Storage different S as service. Um, yeah. Those are important. Uh, those are infrastructure as a service you know, uh, system as a service, applications as a service, security as a service, recently was like a forensics as a service. Um, API, yeah, those are good. What else? What's the most important um, technology that makes cloud computing possible, which is not networking. Yeah, networking is number one, yes, of course. But if you take networking out, what is the most important technology that allows, yeah, it's here, virtualization. So virtualization is the technology which makes, um, cloud computing possible. Um, yeah, pros and cons, uh, problems, you know, ethical problems. Uh, what's the holy grail of cloud computing? Like what would, what would need to be solved scientifically to make cloud computing like amazing? No, it's not here yet. The decentralization, yeah, that, that it, it is a little bit like that, but it's not, that's not it yet. 
So what 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 is the biggest problem with our cloud computing? Like what there are like multiple problems, of course, but what is um, the problem that uh, both the providers and the users uh, suffer from? Ownership, yeah, something to do with ownership. Privacy, yes. So the problem which like we deal with in cloud computing is privacy and the operators, they don't want to be liable for anything. They probably just want to uh, offer a service and like, like Facebook say, yeah, we don't know, like the users post stuff, we, we don't care. Like we should not be liable for, you know, hate speech It's just users. Um, it's the same with cloud computing. Like uh, the cloud operators would like not to be liable for anything. They should just work as a technology providers, right? Uh, so the technology which would enable that is a uh, homomorphic encryption. So it's an encryption which would allow uh, cloud services to operate on the encrypted data in such a way that they never know what the data is, but they can offer a service. They can do something with the encrypted data such that they are not liable for the content because they never know what the data is. Uh, so they cannot leak the data, they cannot uh, moderate the data, they cannot filter it, they cannot do anything with it because it's encrypted. Um, so there are some services, uh, for example, like Mega uh, Storage, uh, it's a cloud storage solution where you have your uh, client side keys and you're basically storing encrypted content on their servers and they never have access to it. So they cannot be issued uh, like a warrant saying, yeah, you're violating a copyright material because the, all they have is an encrypted data. There is no plain text movies or plain text anything. It's all encrypted. Um, so they are kind of not, can, cannot possibly be liable for the content because the content is just random bytes and, and so on. So homomorphic encryption is sort of the, uh, the holy grail, which will, you know, a lot of researchers are working towards. Okay, so that was terms. Uh, I don't remember what I uh, meant here. Um, so let's move on to mobile computing. That's right, computer in your pocket. That is an important one. Accessible, yes, but cloud computing is also accessible, right? Cloud is accessible from anywhere at any time, blah, blah, blah. But mobile computing is much more personal, right? Much more uh, intimate. It's a computer in your pocket. Um, what else? IoT, yeah. Human interfaces, yes. Wearables, right? Um, yeah, so technology that sort of uh, works with you instead of you needing to use the technology, that's, that, that is a good point. Um, yeah, wireless may, made it possible. Um, access point, access technology in general, um, yeah. So what made uh, mobile computing possible? Uh, yeah, small, good, good batteries, uh, arm, yeah. So how would you summarize those two points? Yeah, we, we had microprocessors for for a very long time. We didn't have mobile computing. So what what's what enabled mobile computing? Mm, yeah, so uh, micro technology, a uh, min minimization of the um, of the technology. So the smaller uh, form factors that we could get for 
storage, for processing, for batteries, for screen, and so on, for camera, for sensors. Um, so Moore, Moore Law, it, it's spelled M-O-O-R-E, like Moore, like Roger Moore from um, 007. Um, that made the, um, the progression towards the kind of a, a miniaturization of uh, electronics. So that's one factor. So what else? So that, that's one. What, what else? Yeah, so silicon, that's this one. So uh, miniaturization of the kind of a silicon related technologies. What, what else made uh, mobile computing possible? So in fact, we had all of this before we had mobile computing. Uh, network yes access right so being able to pass data over a, a predominantly audio focused network right so what happened was we had a telephone uh, and we had used telephone for audio communication uh, and we started using this technology for sending data and this improvement, the kind of a rapid growth of ability to pass data over a network uh, made kind of a, a mobile computing possible. And then economy of scale uh, was the, the missing kind of ingredient, right? So we had some initial mobile phones like um, in the you know uh, early 2000s, um, but they were kind of not that uh, great because, and, and they were quite expensive, uh, but like the technology became more widespread and then economy of scales kind of made it possible for this kind of explosion. All right, so let's go to the next one, which is a bit harder, uh, edge computing. That one is a little bit more technologically involved. Like, what is it? Where is it? What is it for? Why do we have it? Those are kind of questions uh, you can get in the exam. Yeah, offloading of large tasks, offloading to where? From where, to where? Tough one, huh? I'm sure uh, Susyang will ask that question in the exam. <laughs> I'm sure if the uploading is broken. Uploading is broken? Yeah, maybe there is some network. Make sure you go to the next question. Oh, I'm writing on a wrong one. Thank you. Edge, you should see edge computing. All right, so now we have uh, offloading to a nearby server, not going to the cloud as a whole. Yeah, good. Uh, close to the data source. Yes, good. Uh, to compare latency, smaller scale servers, edge are closer to the end devices. Yeah, perfect, exactly. So latency is the keyword here, right? Um, data centers, first of all, they are spread all over the world. Uh, so like, you know, Google has, and Amazon has data centers in various countries, but Neither of them have a data center in Norway, right? Um, so if you're offloading some work to a data center in uh, using Amazon or Google, it, it will kind of go somewhere quite far away. Uh, and if you need kind of a high latency solution, that's not really good, right? Um, so that is also not the business model that telecommunication companies are in. Like, uh, you know, um, Let's take uh, Norwegian Telecom. Uh, they are not an internet-based company. They are sort of a, a network provider on the infrastructure level. They keep ownership of most of the access points and most of the edge um, devices. And now that like they came up with the idea that like they could offer services that provide uh, low latency solutions to situations where a fully blown cloud service provider uh, is not capable to compete with them, right? Uh, so that's where 
uh, they, this kind of a technology comes into play. And that's what um, some of the new business models are sort of based on. So yeah, that's, uh, that, those are all good answers. Uh, you may need to elaborate a little bit more in the, in the exam, but uh, you kind of, you get, you, you get it. Um, that's right. So they introduced some solutions to, the, to some of the latency and uh, access um, problems, but they kind of introduced some other, other challenges, right? Uh, where is edge computing very popular in? Like, what is the domain where edge computing is like a de facto, you know, um, go-to solution? AR, um, yes, I would say, but it's not the the most one. Uh, cities, someone said. What what do do you mean? Uh, what do you mean by cities? Uh, where it is able to set up enough base stations to basically cover the entirety of the area and as yeah. many as possible. Yeah, for and what purpose? Can, uh, to allow complete access to the, the network from everywhere all the time with as low latency as possible, with, a, as lit, with as effective overlap as possible while moving between the zones. Sure, but that, that kind of offers you access. Uh, so the, the access layer is different to computing layer, right? Uh, you, you understand the difference? So for example, in cities, yes, you have kind of a very good, um, let's say 5G coverage or 4G coverage. You can have a very good um, quality of service for your communication, for your network access, but you're not really doing any computing on the edge. So when is doing computing on the edge the kind of important aspect? So, so some people said uh, AR or mobile AR uh, makes the reality. Yes, I agree. So but that's not the domain for the edge computing. What, you know, why, why suddenly edge became so hot topic? What is another buzzword which became hot topic? It has been already mentioned. Exactly, IoT, that's right. So IoT drives edge computing, right? And AR uh, and mixed reality is kind of part of it, but uh, IoT, exactly, yeah. self-driving cars, this is the sort of the, the push uh, because you do need to do low latency computing, right? And you don't want to be sending data from millions of sensors to the central data storage somewhere in US you want to do some sort of a reactions or some sort of things kind of close to the, uh, to the sensors and to the, uh, to the edge of the network. So those are good examples. Yes, exactly. All right, uh, let's move on. Next uh, large-ish topic is um, decentralization versus distribution. What is the difference? What is decentralized system and what is distributed system and what do they not have in common? Why do they, uh, yeah, where do they differ? Give examples or elaborate on what are the differences. So if, if you have two systems and you have to classify them and say, okay, system A is decentralized and system B is distributed, what would your criteria be? How would you distinguish them? It's hard to, to do the very comprehensive answer like with few words in a, in a box, right? So I, I give you that, <laughs> that it might be kind of um, uh, difficult to capture the essence. Uh, the, that one is, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, not, not bad. It, it's not incorrect, it's somewhat correct. Um,
uh, can a system uh, which is decentralized be non-distributed? Can I have a non-distributed decentralized system? That, that is a hard question. Right, so um, yeah, so the answer, the, the answer I don't think so, but the other way around is possible. Like you can have distributed system, which is centralized. Um, so the answer to both of those questions, it's kind of, it depends on what do you mean by decentralized and what do you mean by distributed? Uh, so if you, focus on centralization and decentralization in terms of control and author authorship, like, like this uh, yellow box says, then you can have a centrally uh, built central, centralized system technologically, which is decentralized in terms of control. Um, but it kind of depends exactly on what do you mean by decentralization and distribution in terms of what, on which layer do you sort of discussing it? If you're discussing it on that, like just pure technology layer, like this single processing versus multiple processing, then that's a different, different answer, different story. Then if you distinguish between the different layers, right? Um, so this is a little bit more um, understanding question of what, what does it mean? And like the definition questions too. Um, so when we say distributed, we more often than not think about distribution in terms of technology, right? So a Gmail is a single centrally managed, uh, you know, uh, email solution, which is distributed because Google holds data centers all over the world and they don't hold your email in a single data center. It, they spread it all over the place, right? But it's just Google managing that. It's a single uh, controller and single kind of a control uh, layer. And if that is attacked or if that one is taken down, the whole system will stop functioning, even though it is distributed, right? Um, if the system is functioning, but I kind of attack one of the data centers, which wipes part of your email, then you know part of the email will be lost. So you need the distribution doesn't prevent system to go down. If one element is um, targeted, you will need redundancy. You will have to have a distributed plus redundant system to be able to survive some partially uh, not working components and so on and so forth. So this is uh, something you kind of may need to elaborate a little bit and sort of dive um, a little bit more into. Um, yeah, but it's, yeah, I think you're kind of getting the, you understand this. So um, another hard one, in-process communication. What is it? Why do we have it? Where is it used? Give me examples. Have you used one yourself? How? Is the has was was the slide moved to the next one? I hope so. Yeah, uh, for these like questions where we can put in multiple times, we have to manually move ourselves. So I see. Be careful about that. Okay. All right. I understand.
why don't we see anything? Submitted something, is it hidden? I know, why? That looks strange. I think what happened was, uh, no? I see, the, I see the answers if I go to the moderation, but they haven't been showing for some reason. Okay, uh, I need to be clicking. Okay, so uh, pipes and Linux, um, that's that's example, yeah, that's a good example. Um, so, um, Again, it kind of depends a little bit what is the process concept, like what do we mean by process? Um, so like if you say in process, then you cannot be communicating between processes because you're kind of inside a single process, right? So that would be a little bit conflicting, but I kind of know what you mean that you have some sort of uh, tasks happening inside the process and then you kind of are notifying one another, right? So again, it, it has to do a little bit with the language and the choice of terms. Um, so, uh, you know, we usually call process the thing that is kind of um, more like a business process, more like an encompassing, uh, it, it's kind of like an OS process, right? And then we talk about the, the tasks and all the threads as part of the larger process, right? Uh, and then if you have, uh, and, and then you have those kind of a security models where you talk about something that happens inside a single process and that's what that would be. Um, <clears throat> so pipes technically would not be in process, they would be between process, right? Um, yeah, so pipes would be the slightly different one. I only have two answers, I don't know why. Three, give us a hint. Strange, yeah. Uh, but you you kind of get the the idea. So uh, this if, one might be buggy there. Yeah, something is a bit buggy. I, I can see five five people answered, but I only see three questions. Uh, I anyway, just wrote test, but yeah. Um, what I wanted to say is that uh, if you get a question and you're not quite sure what it means, you can ask uh, what it means, or you can assume, like you can say. Uh, assuming that the process is a collection of threads, then we can use this and that, right? Um, so it, it, it has to do uh, with some form of um, communication between threads, you know, if you sort of really strictly talk about this. So in process means I have multiple threads. What are the communication mechanisms there? Well, you have mutexes, you have synchronization primitives, you have shared memory models, uh, you have channels or, you know, um, uh, message passing buses. So those are kind of the, the technologies which are used for in-process communication. Pipes in Linux would be for the intra-process communication, right? So something that allows different processes to, com to communicate with one another. So pipes in Unix would be kind of the intra-process communication, not in-process communication. But then again, it kind of depends how, you know, what do we mean by in-process, right? All right, another buzzword. So I'm moving the slide. So you have to move ma yourself manually. Uh, it's kind of blockchain now. So uh, I think this one is a word cloud, right? Uh, you should, yeah, exactly. So um, what is the um, yeah, distributed ledger? That's that's good one. Decentralization. Those are good terms. Um, hash table, uh, you know, blockchain technically would be like a hash list. <laughs> uh, mining, yes. Do you know how mining works? Do you know how the blockchain is um, organized up and only? That's a good one. Immutable, yeah, that's a good one. What exactly is computationally heavy? Um, why do we have cryptocurrency? Um, so the interplay between the technology and the economic uh, incentives which make the system possible. Uh, so you can sort of, 
elaborate a little bit more about um, the the initial uh, associations, of course, are fine. Um, do you know what bloom filters are? Do you know what hash functions do we use and why do we use hash functions? Is there an encryption in the blockchains or we don't really use encryption? Um, how is the private public key cryptography used? Do, what do we use it for? Do we use it for encryption or do we use it for validation, uh, for signing? Yeah, Shawan, what's the what's the problem with Shawan? Shawan has been uh, demonstrated by Google to be uh, susceptible to a particular form of attack. What what was that attack? What are what are possible attacks on hashing functions and what Shawan is susceptible to? At least Google can do it. What's the keyword? Brute force, yeah, that's that's good. But brute force of what? What what we are brute forcing? Collisions, perfect, exactly. That's the keyword. So again. Um, strategy okay oral exam you are kind of uh, graded on uh, how you understand uh, the topic so your explanations are worth a lot um, so if you for example forgot the term like you forgot the term collisions okay but you ex explain you, ex you you describe it's like yeah i have those two documents they are different but they kind of hash to the same hash uh, you understand the concept you sort of forgot uh, the the term right so like uh, understanding the concept and and forgetting the term will kind of discount you I don't know like twenty percent right if you know the term if you know the term and you know that the, the meaning of the term that's hundred percent right and you do need to to say this uh, if you just say that the term if you say collisions and then we ask you what does it mean and you cannot explain yeah that's a big problem right so that that, that um you know uh this this count your answer quite a lot so uh understanding what those terms are and knowing what those uh and and using the terms you 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 sort of should make a conscious effort in the exam to do that right uh to kind of recall uh, those terms we we often lead you like in the oral exam we often kind of ask those uh, supporting questions to lead you to this to this term to this kind of concept that is the answer right uh, and then if you click and you answer that's great if you don't then yeah it's sort of we move on but uh it is sort of like uh, we have like a sheet and we kind of discount some of the uh, things that you sort of didn't mention, okay? And you should have because that was the the thing to mention, right? Of course, like I led you to this collision thing, like it's not related to blockchain directly, uh, but um, you know, um, the, the question answer sort of sessions, they sometimes kind of unfold in, in particular direction, right? Um, all right, so the next one, uh, moving the slide. And the next one is, what is a blockchain solution to? What is the problem that the blockchains, blockchains solve? In, in general, uh, of course, there are different blockchains and they sometimes solve different problems. But in general, uh, what is the, the problem that you can't, for example, solve with a database? Yeah, a little bit more, uh, more details, please. It is a uh, yeah, that's kind of related, uh, but not exactly. So uh, try try to be a bit more specific. So the yellow one is kind of uh, sorry. Uh, the yellow one is kind of um, 
the answer uh, originally, right? So the original white paper for Bitcoin was in direct, uh, it was a direct argument to the manipulation of the uh, central bank uh, minted currencies, uh, which led to the, uh, I mean, th th there was a financial problems because the banks were kind of giving loans, which they should not be giving. So they kind of uh, gave, uh, they generated more value that should have been generated. They took too much risk. And then the governments, uh, the, especially the US government, to buy them out kind of uh, printed more money. And that allowed the, the banks to be kind of uh, bought out. And that has impacted some, you know, it had some uh, economical um, effects. So the, the Bitcoin was sort of uh, an, an argument saying like, uh, let's have a currency that cannot be manipulated, that cannot be centrally controlled, uh, which just evolves and is controlled by the economy itself. Like uh, you can't just print more, more of it. If you want to, there is kind of a limited supply and that's, that's it. Um, so that was the original thing. And, and the centralization is um, kind of uh, the, the, the thing that uh, started the, the blockchain um, technology and innovation in the space to allow um, immutable append only ledgers, which are not controlled by any single entity uh, and cannot be manipulated by any single entity uh, to manipulate um, the, the kind of a large decentralized ledger, you would have to have, you know, a 51% majority, so so-called like uh, more than 50% of the network to kind of uh, swing some of its operation to in your favor. Otherwise it kind of behaves as, um, as a kind of um, a system that doesn't have a central control, right? Yeah, that is kind of difficult. Um, all right, so then I'm going to the next question. Uh, what is did? And it's not a past tense in English of do. We mean something else. What do we mean? What is it? Why it came? No, it's not digital identity. That, that's a wrong answer. It's, yeah, I mean, it, it is related to digital identity. It's close, but that is completely missing the point of it. What is the, the point that it missed? There is like one keyword missing. Exactly, it is a decentralized ID. It's a decentralized digital identity. It's a decentralized identifier, right? Okay, why, why do we have it? Well, it's similar to the previous question, okay? We try to avoid having a centrally managed registry which issues identifiers. We want to be able to have identifiers that are decentralized, okay? Um, so let's say uh, domain names, what would you say? Is domain names uh, good global identifiers like digital identifiers that are decentralized or not? Okay, can you repeat? No. Why not? Yeah, it, it, it's actually uh, not uh, operated by few companies. It, it's actually worse than that because it, it's a hierarchy. So there is this, uh, uh, you know, US governing body, which controls everything. And that issues kind of a mandate to, uh, for countries to manage their own uh, country level domains. And then the country level domain registrar, they issued a kind of a mandate for particular service providers and companies to do this, but it kind of goes hierarchically always up all the chain to the kind of a single, single uh, yeah, exactly, registrars. Um, uh, single kind of a global regis registrar 
which is kind of issuing that and kind of uh, providing that, right? So domain names are used as uh, digital identifiers uh, and they are kind of unique uh, and you can uh, demonstrate ownership of them because the registrars keep the record of who owns what, but it is, yeah, it's definitely not a decentralized system, right? All right, another one in the same spirit, um, verifiable credentials. Um, why do we have this concept? What is it for? What it can be used for? Give examples. Um, What is it related to? What is it part of? Who is working on it? What standards do you know? Um, and so on and so forth. Again, I think there is a bug again. This one is bugged, I think. Yeah, that one is bugged. Three people answered, I don't see anything. Um, selective disclosure, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Selective disclosure of what? Um, yeah, that, that somewhat, yes, but not really, uh, um, okay, let's move touch ID. Yes. Verify identity to verify an identity of someone without giving too much personal data. Yes, that's good. Um, Yeah, that's right. So you should be able to prove certain things without actually revealing your identity, right? So the, the question which says to prove you are you, um, yeah, that can be misrepresented. Uh, so, uh, so for example, I, you know, a, a typical example is you go to a pub uh, which uh, allows people over 21 to enter and you want to get in. So how you can get in? Currently you have to show a passport or show a national ID or show a driving license, right? Uh, and then you're sort of revealing your name, you're revealing your nationality, you're revealing your date of birth, you're revealing a lot of information which is there, which you don't need to reveal, right? Um, so this, uh, th th there was like this, um, uh, doesn't click anymore. I can't go back to uh, selective disclosure, right? So what we would like to do is to say, look, I can uh, prove that I, I am over 21 without revealing any of, the, of that information, right? So if you do have kind of a credential issued, um, issued to you by, um, I don't know, by your government or by the shop, like a liquor shop might have been checking that as well because you have to be over a certain age to buy tobacco or to buy um, alcohol, uh, then what happens is you sort of have this handshake, you have this verifiable credential and you're kind of demonstrating the ownership of the credential and the uh, prover, the, the person who wants to check, doesn't learn anything about you, but they may have a UI which shows the picture of the person with whom that particular verifiable credentials is associated with. So they don't learn uh, your name, they don't learn where you live, your nationality, they don't learn anything, but they might be shown a picture to validate that the person standing in front of them and the person who uh, digitally uh, proved the verifiable credential is basically the same person, right? Um, so um, that's one typical example that you could use to explain how it happens and how this kind of a selective disclosure happens. Um, all right, let's move on. Uh, anonymous communication protocols, what they are, give examples, where they are used for, why they are used for, why do they exist, who came up with them first, um, how is, uh, you know, how they can be circumvented, how can you use them, Things like this. Good, very good. So 
So how, how can they be circumvented? Good. What other what other types of attacks do you know? So if you have a laptop and you go to the yeah code injection, um, you can be even simpler than that. Um, so uh, let's let's say um, you have a Tor service over Tor, and you have a um, you have a client that accesses it over Tor, and the the, the service uh, has a logo which is hosted on Amazon over a plain IP service, uh, IP TCP IP network. What will happen if you try to open that uh, that uh, hidden service? What will your browser do? Yeah, that's a, that's also possible. But in the example of the logo, like a PNG image being on the Amazon, what will your browser do when you open the hidden service over Tor? Exactly, it will say, yeah, I, I want to render that image and it will download it. So then on the Amazon, what you will see what you will have on the Amazon site if you control that uh, that service which serve that image. What will be in the logs? Sure, exactly. So here you, you are accessing a hidden service over a very secure protocol and leaking your IP very easily if you don't do what? what? What do you need to do to prevent this to happen? You can say, okay, I am not gonna download any uh, external scripts and I'm not gonna uh, uh, download any images. Right, so I, I'm disabling uh, scripts and I'm disabling downloading of images. Then what can happen? <laughs> it's not an image, it's a, a, a different resource. So can you possibly disable downloading any possible resources? Um, yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> so what, what do you need to do? You need to turn off, but you need to turn off what? Yeah, that, that is kind of a, a harder question. You basically have to turn off the, um, you, you have to uh, turn off an ability for your laptop to make TCP IP connections that don't go through the uh, Tor gateway that you just established for yourself to be able to access the Tor services. So in effect, what you are making is that your laptop or whatever device you're using is only able to use Tor cannot do any plain TCP IP at all, right? Uh, otherwise, you have the potential of leaking your IP to some external services, and you can also be inadvertently uh, browsing a, a web um, from your plain TCP IP stack, which correlates to your activity in, in the Tor, right? So that is another, like th 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 that's, that leads to this kind of a metadata collection as well. So uh, you basically have to disable um, your normal networking and only go over Tor. All right, uh, we have to speed up, otherwise we run out of time. Uh, wearable computing, same story. Um, I think that I, I will not leave you much time. I think we kind of covered that uh, quite well. So I will ask a next one. Uh, the next one is what does edge intelligence mean? Um, 
what what do you associate that one with we alluded to that before and you did mention it before um but uh is it the broken one I, yeah that's one of those uh i probably made the wrong choice of what format it should be presented uh yeah so ar is a good example of that um so in the exam you will need to kind of elaborate a little bit more uh on on what does it mean right and kind of elaborate why it is important and what is usually uh, meant by the edge intelligence term all right uh next one uh quantified self that has to do with the um uh with the wearable computing sensing and doing studies on the data that is collected that is very personal and it is usually uh self-collected data by the people who are doing it to themselves so it can um you know uh, you have services like wearable services which for example are used for activity tracking like your running and your exercises and things like this uh which are uh not quantified self but they are source of data uh to um to, uh, to to be used for the quantified self movement or quantified quantified self research so do you need to kind of be able to elaborate on it a little bit and be able to elaborate on what value doesn't bring and what um difficulties it has and and so on and so forth um so like you know bias uh personal bias uh it's really hard to make an experiment on you where you don't know uh, what the expected outcome is and that you have kind of a, you know, and um, yeah, you have kind of a much bigger personalization capabilities. You can, um, there is this whole movement of personalized med medicine, uh, which is sort of um, an offshoot of the quantified self uh, so you need to kind of elaborate on on all those topics, possibly if you pick the quantified self subtopic, right? All right, one more on the um, on the digital uh, blockchain slash identity. Sorry. All right, so some of you will excel in this question uh, because you spent uh, the whole semester investigating it and working with it. Uh, some of you will need to uh, kind of uh, do a little bit of homework, reading a, a little bit about it and sort of um, thinking about it. So uh, like when, when I say examples of digital wallets, like for what, right? Give me examples of, of digital wallets for particular things that you know of that kind of exist on, on your mobile phone, right? Like the iPhone has a, a wallet app. Uh, what is that for, right? Uh, what can you store there? Um, yeah, so that um, you see that the question is a bit vague, right? It says, give examples of digital wallets, right? Uh, so you need to give examples of, um, of digital wallets. So you can say, you know, I have uh, an iPhone and I have a digital wallet where I can store my boarding passes. Uh, <laughs> and I can do payments also because uh, I can store my credit card details and then I use Apple Pay. And it is called a uh, wallet, right? Um, I also have this uh, Dash wallet where I store my cryptocurrencies in. And I also would like to use a uh, uh you know uh spruce uh wallet which allows me to store my decentralized identifiers and my self-sovereign identity uh based identities and verifiable credentials so you kind of need to be able to el elaborate the question is very vague and very broad right? this one and, is bugged by the way yeah that one is bugged as well yeah crap iPhone, yeah, self-serving identity wallets, NFC payment wallets. Um, 
it's just like a oddity of like this type of seeing the answers. I think so. Yeah, I think that the the different uh, like it requires me to be clicking here, uh, which sometimes work and sometimes doesn't. It worked worked quite well this time, right? Yeah, Menti has a few of those like weird ways of having a slide. Yeah, that that's right. So sometimes I pick this, sometimes I pick this up um, uh, kind of a global view, and the global view is better because that just works. All right, I'm moving on. Uh, we're running out of time, so we have a couple of more things. Uh, so coordination protocols, don't answer that. Uh, I have to kind of uh, skip through. Uh, we have one more, which is uh, differences between consensus and coordination. Um, and that is kind of a, an elaboration of this, of this right? So um, coordination protocols, and consensus protocols, they are kind of different and they serve different purpose and they work differently. We did cover coordination in much more detail. Uh, that was the uh, Su Xiang um, topic and he, he kind of dived in more detail into how things are done. So they might be more, uh, more discussions on that. And for the coordination versus uh, consensus, we talked a little bit about it in the context of blockchains. So it's a little bit less technical, but more conceptual, right? Um, all right, and then there is um, there is the oral exam. So uh, there will be this project part, and the project part is about your project, and then the course part, which is those uh, three topics, kind of that you randomly pick from the uh, from the pile, and they will kind of be about those things that I just kind of re um, reviewed uh, in this in this lecture. Um, so it is kind of focused on the understanding and on the concepts. The concepts are important. So you need to think what concepts are relevant for this particular thing. You need to try to come up with all those terms that have been used and try to kind of glue it together into uh, some sort of uh, answer that um, uh, connects the, the, the different parts and focuses on what's kind of important. Um, we as I said, like if you forget a particular term, but you do remember what it is and how it works, then you can describe it like in normal words. Uh, what, what do you mean? And that's fine. That, that's 80% of the answer. Um, yeah, we, we, for example, had uh, an oral exam with Simon a couple of years ago, and we had a student who forgot uh, you know, the term double blind or single blind, but the student could explain the difference between those two uh, types of uh, experimental setups. And that's fine, like it's, uh, it's a good answer, even though you forgot the actual term, right? Um, it, it, it's not an A answer, like, uh, like for, you know, for a really good answer, you do expect the students to remember what double blind and single blind is. Uh, but if you just remember the concepts, that gives you quite a lot of uh, coverage, right? In terms of um, answer. Uh, all right, and then the final one, uh, this one, I, I, I think it's kind of not really true, um, but it's sort of, uh, that's what the website says. And, uh, and I, am, I am quite sure that this is wrong, uh, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, I'm telling you what the website says, uh, and I'm telling you that if I can, uh, if if we can give you then a single hundred percent grade for the portfolio, that's what it will be. Uh, it will not be that split. If we have to give the split, then um, the the oral is sort of the defining grade. Uh, but because the oral includes you talking about the report then it's sort of like the, the reports and projects up kind of, you know, part of that anyway. So, um, yeah. Okay, so I have to zoom through the, the final, uh, final three slides a little bit faster. Um, if you have questions, uh, ask, ask now. If you have questions later, then uh, ping me on, on Discord. Would you just prefer us to just do it in um, the Discord channel versus private messages? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, exactly. Because then I can answer and everybody can hear it, right? So use yeah, the issue good. tracker on, on um, GitLab or use the uh, the channel on Discord. 
because that's the, the yeah. Then I don't have to repeat myself. Okay, great. So I will stop recording. Thank you very much for participating.